Before we start looking at how money is really created, we need to have a quick look at what types of money we actually use in the economy. There's actually three types of money that we use in the economy. As a member of the public, you will only ever have used two of them. The simplest form is cash, the £5, £10, £20 and £50 banknotes and the metal coins that most of us will have in our wallets at any point in time. As you probably know, only the government via the Royal Mint and the Bank of England is allowed to create these. If you try to make your own at home, pretty soon you'll get the police kicking down your door at two in the morning. So, now imagine that you need to pay your rent and your landlord has an account with a different bank to you. When you log into your internet banking and make the payment to your landlord, your bank has to send some money to your landlord's bank to settle and complete the transaction. Of course, the banks don't want to make these payments to each other in physical cash because carrying all this money around is dangerous, even if they use protected security vans and guards with bulletproof vests and helmets. So, instead, they use a type of electronic money, which is called central bank reserves. Remember that name, because we'll be using it a lot in this video. Central bank reserves are effectively an electronic version of cash, and banks use these electronic central bank reserves to make payments to each other. The central bank reserves are created by the Bank of England, we'll cover how later on, and they can only be stored in accounts that the big banks have with the Bank of England. To get one of these bank accounts at the Bank of England, you have to be a bank. So as members of the public, we can't get our hands on any central bank reserves. We just have to use the physical cash. So the first two types of money are one, cash, and two, central bank reserves. Remember that central bank reserves are like an electronic version of cash that only the banks can use to make payments between themselves. The third type of money is a type of money that isn't created by the Bank of England, the Royal Mint, or any other part of government. This third type of money is the type of money that's in your bank account right now. This money is just numbers in a computer system. Bankers and economists refer to this type of money with jargon such as bank deposits, demand deposits, site deposits, or bank credit. These terms all pretty much mean the same thing and are used interchangeably. They might also be referred to as bank liabilities. This is the accounting term, because this money is a liability of the bank to you, i.e. it's what the bank needs to repay you at some point in the future. Now, in a legal sense, the numbers in your account aren't really money at all. But despite that, they serve exactly the same purpose as the £10 and £20 notes that you might hold in your wallet. It's this type of electronic bank deposit money that now makes up over 97% of all the money used in the UK economy. Less than 3% of the money supply is cash created by the government. And all this electronic bank money is created by banks, as we'll explain now. The balloon model. Let's revisit the multiplier model that we saw in the last video. Remember that it describes the money system as having a base of base money. In the simplified version, the base is made up of cash. In reality, it's not just cash in this base, it's also the electronic central bank reserves that banks keep in their accounts at the Bank of England. But it's true that this base is made up of money, either cash or electronic, that was created by either the Bank of England or the Royal Mint. Now let's look at the top of the pyramid. The rest of the pyramid is made up of the third type of money, the electronic bank-created money. So the pyramid is split up into a base of government-created money and a tower of bank-created money on top. Remember that we said this pyramid in theory is limited by the reserve ratio? Well, there is no reserve ratio, and there hasn't been for years. This means that the total amount of money in the economy isn't really limited. It can keep expanding without coming to a point at the top. So the pyramid is actually the wrong shape to describe the money system. In reality, it's closer to a balloon of bank-created money wrapped around a smaller balloon of base money. In this case, the base money is the electronic central bank reserves and cash. As we'll see in this video, the Bank of England has relatively little control over the total size of the balloon of bank-created money. They can't really control how much money is in the economy, even if they claim to be able to. The outer balloon of bank-created money could expand out of control and the Bank of England wouldn't be able to stop it, at least not within the current monetary system. We saw this happen before the crisis. In 2006, the outer balloon of bank-created money was 80 times bigger than the inner balloon of base money. The multiplier wasn't 10 times like the textbook models suggest, it was actually 80 times. And then when banks panicked during the crisis and refused to lend, the Bank of England pumped a load of extra base money into the inner balloon through the scheme known as quantitative easing. 
but this didn't lead to a massive increase in the size of the outer balloon. Right now, the outer balloon, the amount of bank-created money, is only 14 times bigger than the inner balloon. This shows that there is no real connection between the amount of central bank reserves or base money and how much money that the banks are able to create. So what actually affects the ratio between bank-created money in the outer balloon and government-created cash and central bank reserves in the inner balloon? What determines how much money is created for the economy? The research that we've done suggests that the amount of money that banks can create is not determined by reserve ratios or by regulation or by the control of the Bank of England. The reality is that the total amount of money depends on the confidence of banks. If they're feeling confident, banks will create new money by lending more. And when they're scared, they limit their lending, which limits the creation of money. So the size of the outer balloon really depends on the confidence and incentives of the banks. Or to put it another way, the amount of money in the economy depends on the mood swings of bankers. Given that the amount of money in the economy can determine the health of the economy, does it sound like a good idea to have such an important thing decided by the mood swings of bankers? Probably not. OK, back to the numbers in your bank account. These numbers are all created by banks. The vast majority of these numbers were created when somebody took out a loan from a bank. Let's see how this happens. A customer, who we'll call Robert, walks into a Barclays bank and asks to borrow £10,000 for home improvements. Barclays runs a quick automated credit check and decides that the customer can be relied on to keep up repayments on the loan. The customer signs a loan contract, promising to repay the £10,000 plus the interest over the next four years, according to an agreed monthly schedule. This loan contract is a legal contract that binds the customer to make repayments to the bank. This means that it is a legal contract that is considered to be worth £10,000 plus the interest. Because it's an asset, Barclays can record the loan on its balance sheet. Now, if you haven't come across a balance sheet before, don't worry, it's pretty simple. There's two parts to a balance sheet. One half records all the things that the bank owns. This could be money, other financial products like bonds and derivatives, bank buildings, computers, and most importantly, the loans it's made. How can you own a loan? Well, if someone signs a contract promising to pay you money, then that contract is worth something. It's considered an asset of the bank. In the case of Robert, the contract that he signs promising to pay the bank £10,000 plus interest over the next few years is worth at least £10,000 to the bank and therefore it is an asset to the bank. So the bank puts an extra £10,000 on its balance sheet like this. Now what about the other half of the balance sheet? The other half of the balance is what's called the liabilities. This is a record of everything the bank owes to other people. On this side you'll find a record of money that the bank has borrowed from other banks or large pension funds. You'll also find all the customer's accounts, because if you remember, the balance of your account is just a number showing what the bank promises to pay you when you ask for your money back. When Robert signed the contract promising to pay the bank £10,000 plus interest over the next few years, he did it because he wanted some money from the bank. So the bank creates a new account for Robert, which is linked to his debit card and just types £10,000 into their computer records. This £10,000 is a liability from the bank to Robert, and it shows up on the other half of the balance sheet. Now, when Robert goes to the cash machine to check his balance, he'll see £10,000, which he didn't have before. All the bank has done to create this new money is type some numbers into an account. It hasn't reduced the balance of anyone else's account, and it hasn't taken any money from some pensioners and moved it into Robert's account. So the process of creating commercial bank money, that's the money that the general public use, is as simple as 1. A customer signing a loan contract and 2. The bank typing numbers into a new account set up for that customer. This new bank created money represents new spending power or money in the economy. Robert can now go and spend his money anywhere in the economy using his debit card, checkbook, internet banking transfers or even by taking cash out of an ATM. But there's a small complication. What happens if Robert goes and spends the new bank-created money with a shop that has a bank account with a different bank, say Lloyd's? If this happens, then Lloyd's will want to see £10,000 of real money from Barclays. Barclays would then need to transfer £10,000 of central bank reserves to Lloyd's to settle the transaction. 
note that from the point of view of Lloyds, receiving a transfer of £10,000 in central bank reserves into its account at the Bank of England is just as good as Barclays pulling up in a truck and dropping off £10,000 in cash, although it's much more convenient for the banks to have the electronic central bank reserves than to carry around all that cash. This process of banks making payments between themselves is called interbank settlement. And it's really important to understand it because it's crucial to the way that banks have been able to gain control over the entire money supply. First, let's look at the simplest example of interbank settlement with just two banks and two customers. Robert, when he receives his loan, goes straight into a DIY store and spends £10,000 on everything he needs. He gets the checkout and pays using his Visa debit card. Here's a simplified version of what happens behind the scenes. First, the DIY store's debit card machine automatically contacts Visa and says, please charge £10,000 to this card number, da 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 Visa's computer systems then dial up Barclays' computer systems and say, Robert's trying to spend £10,000 on his debit card, is that OK? Barclays' computer system check the balance of the account and says yes. Barclays' computer system then reduces the balance of Robert's account by £10,000. Now, Visa's computer system contacts Lloyd's and says, I'm sending you £10,000 for the DIY store's account. Lloyd's then updates the balance of the DIY store by £10,000. However, importantly, when the owners of the DIY store log into their internet banking, they see two figures. One says account balance and the other says available now. For the next couple of days after Robert's come into the shop, the account balance will be £10,000 higher than the available now balance. The £10,000 that Robert has spent isn't available to the DIY store for them to spend just yet. Why? Well, behind the scenes, Barclays needs to settle with Lloyd's. When Lloyd's gets the message that someone has spent £10,000 in the DIY store, it updates their account balance and then calls Barclays to say, send me the money. Barclays could settle with Lloyd's by delivering the £10,000 in cash, but in reality this is just a hassle for both banks. They'd have to find somewhere to store all the cash and a van with security to transport it. So instead, Barclays will settle by making a £10,000 transfer from its reserve account at the Bank of England to Lloyd's reserve account at the Bank of England. Once Lloyd's gets the £10,000 in its account at the Bank of England, then it will update the available balance in the DIY store's account. Now, this was a simple example that involved just one payment between two bank customers, Robert and the DIY store. Only two banks were involved. But in the UK right now, there's around 50 million people with bank accounts. Some of these people make more than one electronic payment a day, and they bank with over 50 different banks. In fact, every day, over 60 million transactions are made between bank accounts in the UK through a number of different payment systems, including Visa, MasterCard, direct debit and online bank transfers. If banks had to go through the whole hassle, in the example with Robert, every time someone bought a sandwich from a supermarket using their debit card, it would get very messy very quickly. But there's a clever way of simplifying the whole thing massively. It's called multilateral net settlement. When you have a lot of individuals and businesses all making payments to each other, that's a lot of money flowing between the different banks. So what the banks do, especially with systems like BAX, which manages direct debits and the type of bank transfers that you make via internet banking is this. First, they put all the payments into a big computer database without actually moving any real money, cash or central bank reserve, about. Then, at the end of the day, or every few hours, they run a process to cancel out as many of the payment flows as possible. For example, imagine a customer at Lloyd's sends his rent, £350, to his landlord's account at Barclays. But on the same day, a customer at Barclays sends his own rent, £400, to his landlord, who happens to be at Lloyd's. The two payments almost cancel each other out, so after cancelling out, or netting in the official jargon, the only money that really needs to be moved is £50 from Barclays to Lloyd's. Because there are millions of payments being cancelled out by this system, the amounts that actually need to be transferred between the banks at the end of the day are usually just a tiny fraction of the total value of the payments made. And this is why, even though in 2007 RBS customers had nearly £700 billion in its customers' accounts, RBS itself only had £17 billion that it could actually use to make payments on behalf of those customers. 
This 17 billion was more than enough for the total netted payments that it would need to make at the end of the day. This netting out effect means that a bank only needs to have a very small amount of available money compared to the total amount that they owe to customers at any particular time. They know that any payments they make to other banks are likely to be cancelled out by payments coming back to it. On some days, the bank customers will spend more than they receive. And at the end of the day, the bank must pay some of its money across to other banks to settle these payments. But on other days, customers will receive more in salaries and other income than they pay out and the bank will end up receiving money from other banks at the end of the day. Over time, the total amount of money needed by the bank doesn't change much. The only time that they would actually need all the money that they owe to their customers is if customers were to panic and ask for their money back at the same time. This is what happened to Northern Rock in the UK and Wachovia in the US, and it can destroy a bank very quickly. This process is what gave rise to the term fractional reserve banking because banks only need to keep enough money to repay a fraction of their customers at any time. We talked about the central bank reserves that banks keep in their accounts at the Bank of England. These reserve accounts don't store cash, just electronic central bank reserves. It's important to appreciate that although central bank reserves are created by the Bank of England, they're still just numbers in a computer system. These numbers are just stored on a file very similar to an Excel spreadsheet. And we could create a billion of them in the time it takes to type out the number you see on your screen. The £150 billion of central bank reserves are no more tangible than the numbers on this screen. And in fact, the entire record of balances of the central bank reserve scheme will take up less space on the Bank of England's computer hard drive than the average song on an MP3 player. Now, the computer system that records all these central bank reserves is referred to by the Bank of England as the Real-Time Gross Settlement Processor, or RTGS Processor. Now, real-time gross settlement isn't as complicated as it sounds. Settlement simply means that it's a system that banks can use to settle their payments to each other. In other words, it's a way for them to transfer money to each other. Real-time gross settlement means that any payment instruction sent to the computer system is processed immediately. If a payment of £100,000 is sent to the system, £100,000 will be transferred automatically. This is in contrast to multilateral net settlement that we discussed just before, in which all the payments are queued up, cancelled out against each other, and only the final net difference is transferred. When a payment is put through the RTGS processor, it's considered to be final. It's also considered to be risk-free. If one bank owes money to another bank, there's always a small chance that it won't be able to pay the other bank. But once the money's arrived in the central bank reserve account, then the deal is finished, because holding central bank reserves is just like holding cash. It's the safest asset you can have. So, at the end of the day, the multilateral net settlement payment systems will cancel out all the smaller payments between different banks, and then they'll tell the real-time gross settlement processor how much the net differences owed between the banks should be. The RTGS system will then transfer the central bank reserves from the banks that owe money to the banks that are owed money. So, let's recap everything we've covered so far, before we look into what actually determines how much money the banks can create. We've seen that the textbook model of money creation suggests that there's a base of central bank or government-created money on top of which the commercial banks can blow up the total money supply by relending the same money over and over again. We saw that this model is actually completely inaccurate. There's no natural limit to how big the money supply can grow, so it's actually better to think about this as two balloons rather than a pyramid. We saw that banks can create money by simply typing numbers into a customer's account when they make a loan. When you sign the contract, the bank gets an asset that balances out the new liability they create when they type numbers into your account. When a customer spends the money the bank has just created, and those payments go to the customers of other banks, then the other banks will call the bank that created the money and ask for them to settle in central bank reserves. But before this happens... Payment systems like BAX and Visa Debit will cancel out the payments against each other, so that only the net difference at the end of the day has to be settled, i.e. transferred, between the banks. This netting out significantly reduces how much money banks really need to keep at any particular time. 
In a few minutes, we'll see what actually limits how much money the banks can create. But first, it's worth asking whether the numbers that banks create can really be considered money.